we are very glad to have Gary Cluso from the University of Georgia, who's going to tell us about Fox Gontrob dual cluster varieties and gross Siebert mirrors. All right, so thank you very much for the invitation to speak uh, at this seminar. So as uh, pointed in the title, I will talk about the relation between uh, two topics. So the first topic is cluster varieties. So as I will review, there are particular complex, non-compact uh, algebraic varieties, which play a particularly important role in representation theory and combinatorics. As I will review the kind of maybe most basic example of cluster variety is simply the torus C star to the N. And more general cluster varieties are like interesting uh, cousins of the torus. And uh, cluster varieties have the uh, particularity to come in dual pairs. So for every cluster variety A, there is a dual cluster variety X. And such a pair of dual cluster varieties are called Fogonshaw of dual cluster varieties. And these cluster varieties, as I will describe in a minute, are actually example of non-compact Calabio varieties. And there is a general setup in which Calabio varieties come in pair, which is a setup of mirror symmetry. And in fact, it has been observed uh, several times from several perspectives that this duality between cluster varieties has something to do with duality in the sense of mirror symmetry. And the point of this talk is to explain a relation between cluster varieties and a particular aspect of mirror symmetry, which is a particular mirror symmetry construction due to Gross and Siebert, which is some very general construction which take as input some Calabio variety and do something with it, taking as input some innovative geometry and produce as output some mirror. So it's really some a construction, which is supposed to be a general way to produce a mirror given an algebraic variety, Calabio variety. And the main so result of this talk, yes, is it already a question? Yes, I was, I, I was uh, yes. Uh, so, so, so previously, there is this notion of duality for cluster varieties, and the idea that it had something to do with mirror symmetry was, only, was some just vague sense, uh, an imprecise sense. I, uh, yeah, so I, I would say. I would say um, I would say something much more precise um, in one minute, or something else which has been checked is that maybe it has been checked that these things are mirror in some appropriate sense, and the point is that it says that several, several meanings for what does it mean to be mirror. So I guess, for example, in something completely orthogonal to what I would talk about today, some people have checked that under some assumption, these things are mirror in the sense of homological mirror symmetry, for example. And so what I will talk about is something else, which is a relation with some like mirror construction. And when I say mirror construction, it's not yet known if this mirror construction produce a mirror which satisfies all the expected uh, realizations of mirror symmetry. And uh, but yeah, I will say something more in, in uh, related to this question in in one minute. So I said the main result of this talk will be that the mirror of a log Calabio compactification of the X cluster variety, where a mirror in this very specific sense of this gross Zibert mirror construction, would be related to the dual A cluster variety. For more precisely, the mirror, as I will explain, is related to the degeneration of the A cluster variety in general. And there is some kind of symmetry between X and A, so the, you will also get the statement in reverse. And so this result I will talk about today is joint work with Ilya Argus, and it's contained in some paper, which is on the archive since uh, a few months. Okay, so my plan for this talk is to say a few words about uh, cluster varieties, uh, what they look like. Then I will tell you something about mirror symmetry and cross Zibert construction of uh, mirror varieties. And at the end, I will talk about the kind of relation between the two. So I start by saying a few words about cluster varieties. So there are particular uh, complex uh, algebraic varieties and they're like a geometric version of something called cluster algebras, which have been introduced by Folim Fomin Zelvinsky with essentially representation theoretic uh, motivations. And the more geometric point of view of cluster varieties is essentially due to Bock and Gonshoff. 
And uh, in this talk, I will not uh, really talk about the representation of theoretic motivations. I will just talk about um, cluster varieties, a particular example of algebraic varieties, because they're, they're the way they will enter in, in connection with, with mirror symmetry. Okay, so uh, there will be a cluster variety for every choice of seed, which is a combinatorial data. So what is it? It's a data of a lattice, I will denote by capital N, which so it just choice of a free abelian group of rank n, so just z to the n, with a specific basis, ei, where the index i run from a set of cardinality n that I denote by i bar. And the other piece of data is a skew symmetric form that I denote by this bracket on this lattice, some integer valued a skew symmetric form. And so there's a picture of way to encode this data. You can encode it into a quiver, which is just a graph where you have uh, n vertices and you think as having one vertex for each basis element of your lattice. And the skew symmetric form is encoded into the adjacency matrix of uh, this graph. So if you have two vertices i and j, uh, the number of arrows between i and j is the value of the skew symmetric form between EI and EJ. So if this thing is positive, you put this number of arrows from I to J. If it is negative, you put this number of arrows from J to I. And furthermore, on this set of uh, vertices, we'll assume that we have a partition into so-called unfrozen vertices and frozen vertices. So on this picture, uh, I denote by a, a round dot, unfrozen vertices, and by a square, uh, the frozen vertices. Okay, so this data just have a graph, oriented graph, finite oriented graph. And some vertices are so-called frozen with a square, and some of them are unfrozen with a dot. And if you have such a combinatorial data, so this thing is called a seed, uh, you can uh, mutate it to produce new seeds. So if you choose one basis element, EK, or equivalent, if you pick one vertex in this graph, then there is such a thing as mutation of a seed at this vertex, which is a way to produce a new seed. So you, the lattice is fixed, the skew symmetric form is fixed, but the basis changes. You produce a new basis, EI prime, by this uh, explicit uh, formula. So EK prime is minus EK, and if i is different from k, er prime is ei plus something determined by skew symmetric form times ek. So I will not spend much time on this formula because in one minute I will give alternative descriptions of, the, of these things. But some of these things is like the standard presentation of cluster varieties. So if you start with a seed, you can mutate it at a vertex. And more precisely, we only allow mutation to uh, unfrozen vertex. So it is where the distinction between frozen and unfrozen matter, we allow this operation only at uh, unfrozen vertices. And so if you start with a seed, you can mutate as some unfrozen vertices, as some unfrozen vertex, you get a new seed, and then you can iterate this construction. So you get more and more and more seeds and possibly Maybe in simple case, you will come back to your starting point. Maybe you get only finitely many seeds, or in complicated situation, you can get infinitely many of them. So now what does this thing have to do with constructing uh, algebraic varieties? Essentially cluster varieties, so called X and A cluster varieties, are obtained by gluing together tori, C star to the N, where there will be one copy of the torus C star to the N for each seed. So the more specifically, the X cluster variety will be obtained by gluing tori spec C bracket N. So N is my lattice Z to the N. So C bracket N is a corresponding uh, like a group ring. So they are just Laurent polynomials in N variables. And so spec of it is just a torus C star to the N. And I consider one copy of such torus for each seed. And then I consider all possible seeds related by mutations. And all these tori are glued together by explicit birational transformations. So the, yeah, I wrote some explicit formula, z to the n goes to z to the n, one plus z to the ek power minus vk comma n. So the ek is like the basis in each seed. And vk, so they are element of the lattice n. 
And VK they are obtained by uh, putting EK into the skew symmetric form. So they are linear form in N, they are element of what I denote by M, which is a dual lattice. And so for example, in this uh, formula, VK comma N is a natural pairing between N and M, the natural duality pairing between the lattice and the dual lattice. And similarly, there is something called the A cluster variety, which is similarly obtained as a union of tori, one for each uh, seed, except the torus is intrinsically spec of C bracket M, where M is a dual lattice. So we are still gluing C star to the end, but somehow you glue the dual C star to the end uh, for A rather than X. And they are glued by, again, by rational transformations, which are again given by some explicit formulas where some of the dual of EK and VK are kind of interchanged. So for example, here on this picture, I have one quiver with only two vertices, E1 and E2, one uh, unfrozen and one frozen that are connected by one arrow. And if you mutate the black vertex, it happens that the only thing that it is doing is to reverse the arrow. And if you mutate again, you just reverse the arrow again, so you come back to your starting point. So actually, in this case, there is only two seeds related by mutations. And so the corresponding cluster varieties will be obtained by gluing together two copies of C star squared, by this kind of explicit cluster by rational transformations. And maybe I should say the obvious case is that if my, um, like for example, if I have N vertices, with no arrows and if they are all frozen, then I cannot mutate anything and I will have a single torus C star to the N as my cluster variety. Okay, so starting from uh, this kind of combinatorial data, you could cook up these algebraic varieties by gluing tori together along these birational transformations. And uh, Falk and Gonshoff predicted that uh, this variety N and X should be dual in some, in some rather precise sense, in the sense of the algebra of regular function on A should admit a canonical basis. So it's linear basis, like so is the algebra of regular function as a vector space over the complex number should admit a canonical basis indexed by integral tropical points of X. So I will say later what this thing means and vice versa. So maybe the kind of simplest example to have in mind is A just torus C star to the N. In this case, the canonical basis is as simple as you can think. It's simply the basis of monomials. Okay, so a regular function on C star to the N. They are just Laurent polynomials in N variables. And you have a natural basis given by Laurent monomials. And uh, this basis is canonical in the sense that, for example, this invariant under Automorphism of C star to the N. And uh, these uh, monomials, if you think about them in an intrinsic way, they correspond to characters of your torus, C star to the N. So they are really co characters of the dual torus. So they are indexed by co characters of the dual torus. And what Falk and Gonshoff uh, were suggesting was that A and X, they are no longer C star to the N, so they are no longer groups. So characters and co-characters no longer make sense, but still there should be some kind of generalization of the characters of the torus, which would form a preferred basis of the algebra of regular function. And they should be naturally uh, parameterized by something having to do with, with the dual variety. And uh, so gross, I can kill made the remark that this conjecture cannot hold in general without positive as assumptions for rather easy, uh, reasons. For, so for example, these tropical ponds, there are always a lot of them, but these varieties, they are not necessarily affine. So they might have very few regular functions in some examples. So this, this kind of duality cannot be true in general. But if you assume that things are like positive enough, for example, if these things are affine roughly, then uh, it should be true. And gross I can kill Konsevich proves that this conjecture holds with the necessary uh, positivity assumptions. And as I will say a bit more about it in one minute, some of their proof relies on uh, ideas and constructions coming from your symmetry. But uh, 
In the construction of symmetry, it's only a motivation to prove this conjecture. And there is not a kind of direct connection with kind of more usual aspects of mirror symmetry, such as, such as uh, enumerative geometry. And, uh, but actually, so as I this conjecture, only old in general under positivity assumptions, but Gross, I can kill Konsevich found a way to formulate, to modify and formulate the conjecture in general. And I will introduce uh, this object because somehow it will appear in the very final uh, statement, the very final part of the talk. So in general, you can consider A cluster variety. And maybe this A cluster variety might have very few regular functions. So this is the duality conjecture of a Gonshoff will not really apply for it. But you can show that this X cluster variety, you can always realize it as a fiber inside a family of varieties called the X cluster variety with principal coefficient that I denote by A print. And essentially, you can partially compactify this family to get something called A print bar in such a way that a special fiber of this family is simply a torus. C star to the n. So A in general is something more complicated than the torus. It might be not affine, it might have very few regular functions, but you can always put it in a family. And when you move in a family, you can somehow degenerate it to something which is simply a torus, C star to the n. And C star to the n is definitely affine, it's definitely have a very nice canonical basis of monomials. And the remark of gross I can kill is that you can always consider what happened formally near this torus special fiber. You can consider formally uh, this family near this special fiber. And the theorem is that some of the original Fogonshaw conjecture is always true for this kind of formal family near this special fiber. So this thing would be a formal deformation of a torus. So it will still be uh, affine and the algebra of regular function on it will admit a canonical basis indexed by integral tropical points of X. So maybe the general duality does not really work for A itself, but once you put A uh, in a family, you kind of degenerate it to something much simpler. In the formal neighborhood of this much simpler object, you have a nice duality uh, property. And I'm mentioning that here, because in the statement, the comparison with mirror symmetry, this particular family uh, will play a role. Yeah. What does um what does the UF subscript mean under that? Yes. So I guess I skip it here. So N U F it's the uh, same thing as the lattice N. It has a basis given by the element E I. But I'm only looking to the so unfrozen uh, uh, vertices. Great. So it is still a lattice Z to some power except it's only power number of unfrozen uh, vertices. So, so very concretely, yeah, so here what I wrote spec C bracket N U F, you think it just C star to the power something. And then N U F plus, I'm just looking to the cone, positive cones spanned by the EI. So actually you think it's just an affine space. And then I take the formal, formal completion near the origin of this affine space. So actually it's something very simple. This base is just some ring of formal of power series in some bunch of formal variables. Okay, and what we really use is actually, so here I wrote these kind of formulas for uh, cluster varieties, but I did not really want into explaining what they mean. Actually, there is some kind of maybe more geometric uh, interpretation of cluster varieties, which actually will be more directly connected to what I want to talk about. It's a realization of cluster varieties as actually something quite simple, blow-ups of toric varieties. So starting from the data of a seed, so which was this latest N and this basis element EI in N, you can const first of all construct a toric variety so you have these vectors vi obtained by evaluating the skew symmetric form on ei. So you get elements in the dual lattice m. And you pick sigma, a fan in m tensor r in the real vector space spanned by this lattice. And you ask that this, uh, this fan contains the rays spanned by the vector vi. 
And to make things technically simple, I will assume it's a fan of a smooth projective toric variety. So if you just pick the rays spanned by the VI, uh, this fan in general is not the fan of a smooth projective toric variety, but you can always add extra rays, extra con to make it into a fan of a smooth projective toric variety. So here there is some kind of choice for that. But at the end, uh, what we'll do will be essentially kind of independent of this choice. So here we just pick that. And now I denote by D sigma i, there is one toric divisor of this toric variety for every ray spanned by vi. And now for every i, we'll consider h i, which will be an hypersurface inside the toric divisor D sigma i, which is defined by this explicit equation one plus z to the e i equal to zero. So you can check that it makes sense. The fan is living in M and EI are living in N. So Z to the EI is naturally a function on the big torus inside this toric variety. So one plus Z to the EI is naturally a function on the big torus. And essentially the duality pairing between EI and VI is zero which means that the order of vanishing or pole of this function along the divisor is zero. So actually you can restrict this function extend and you can restrict it to the boundary divisor and look to the hypersurface there defined by this equation. So you get HI, which is hypersurface in the boundary. So it's like co-dimension two from the point of view of the total space. So here I wrote down some very simple example corresponding to the previous quiver with two vertices. So I'm just drawing a fan where you have two special rays corresponding to V1 and V2. And I'm doing one of these broad operations only for unfrozen vertices. So here I have one frozen, one unfrozen vertex. So I am blowing up a single point corresponding to V1. So in this very simple example, I'm just looking to this fan, which is a fan of P2. So I just start with a complex projective plane. And I have a toric boundary consisting of three lines. And I'm blowing up a point uh, contained in one uh, of these lines. But it's important that this point is not one of the toric fixed points. It is not one of the corners of this triangle. It is a point somewhere in the interior of the boundary. Okay. It's related to the fact that, yes, this equation is from one plus z to the ei. It's like this thing is not a monomial. It's, kind of, it's not a toric, toric like equation. So I'm not blowing up the, uh, the corners, I'm blowing up some point on the boundary. And so the point is that- So I have a, this is gonna be kind of a, it's a naive enough question, I'm not sure how to ask it correctly, but I think of a yeah. cluster, with the, okay, so you start with the seed and I think of the mutations as you're pressing buttons on the, on the unfrozen. And a, a priori, I, you don't know how many seeds are possible to reach? I guess there could be an infinite number of seeds. Right? Yeah, that's correct, yes. And, 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 and so I give you a seed and I know you can press these buttons and you have no idea how many seeds you can get to, but you're now giving me a recipe from one seed to give me a cluster variety, which looks like it's finite type and has finite. So somehow you seem to have answered this question. Yes, yeah, so, so there will be a small subtlety. So yeah, yeah, I'm telling you how to produce something. And the question is, oh, what I'm producing here is exactly related to what I described previously. Right. And the answer is exactly like this theorem, of course I can can, which tell you that if I start with some seed, I cook up some toric variety, and then I blow up these uh, hypersurfaces contained in the boundary. I blow up this co-dimension two loci. I get, so I go from this toric variety X sigma to a new variety X. And I consider D the strict transform of the toric boundary D sigma. So right. I get a pair XD. And I'm looking now to the complement X minus D. And the theorem, of course, I can kill is that this thing, which is a very nice finite type algebraic variety, is uh, isomorphic with some subtlety up to co dimension two to this X cluster variety. So this thing is a precise a statement. So in this X cluster variety, if you really consider it as, as itself, as this union of tori, you can have like bad properties. It might not be finitely, the algebra might not be finitely generated. It might even be non-separated somehow. But the claim is that if you are 
ready to throw out code immersion tool or SI, actually it is has this alternative, very nice, very finite type uh, description. So, so the resulting thing you get depends is you know, given the seed, this thing you've produced is canonical. But if you choose a different seed that's retained by mutation, you may get a different one, that a different canonical thing. So, so, so actually this X minus D, I claim actually it's canonical. Oh, nice. So, so actually, so, okay, maybe canonical up. Up to mutation or like if you mutate, do you okay, still so, Okay, maybe under some very small technical assumptions, it would be canonical. And so maybe I should explain, okay, so what is this mutation operation from this kind of alternative description? It just means that the same variety, like actually the same uh, variety can be obtained by this blow up construction in many different ways. So it's clear that if you construct something by blowing up a toric variety, there will be a natural C star, there will be a natural torus inside coming from the torus in the toric variety. But maybe the same variety will be obtained as blow up in many, many different ways. And in fact, it could be obtained as a blow up in infinitely many different ways. And so this thing is a kind of relation. So here, this thing looks like a very nice finite type. And some of the complexity of the mutations is some of the complexity of the birational geometry. So you can present that as blow ups in many, many different ways. And so in like, so this XD is not really canonical, but this complement X minus D is kind of canonical. So. Wonderful. Okay. And uh, okay, so what we really care about in this talk will be XD. So we not really care about the honest thing obtained by gluing this tori, which might be something complicated. We really care about this kind of geometric realization, which is a nice finite type algebraic variety. And uh, and okay, so so but yeah, so we can so the cluster variety is really the complement x minus t, but uh, to do something, we'll often pick one of these presentation as interior of a compactification x t. And this x t, I will call it the log Halabier compactification of the x cluster variety. And it is indeed log Halabier in the sense that this is a divisor d. It's an anti-canonical device. In the same way that the uh, toric variety, the union of toric boundary is anti-canonical, uh, it's still true if I take this D, essentially by the formula which tell you how the anti-canonical divisor behaves under blob, uh, this thing will, is, will still be the case. So in particular, this complement X minus D, the cluster variety itself, will always will always be a kind of non-compact Calabio. It will always have a uh, top degree uh, algebraic or holomorphic volume form, which actually would have first order pole along along this compactification D. So, so here D is or D sigma is the entire toric boundary, not just the ones corresponding to your uh, unfrozen. Yeah. So here D sigma is the yeah, entire entire toric boundary. Yes. So, so you know, if I do no, no, no blow up at all, then I would just look to some toric variety with boundary and the complement would just be a torus, which is Calabio because on the torus, there is a top volume form like dz1 over z1, which dz2 over z2, which dzn over zn. And, but it's still true if I do some blow ups, the interior will still have a such top degree a volume form. So it will still be a non-compact uh, Calabio. And so this thing will be my kind of transition to the second part of this talk. I want to talk about mirror symmetry, which is something which has to do more generally with Calabio varieties. And uh, so some of cluster varieties are some of like very special kind of non-compact uh, Calabio varieties. So what I want to explain is what is this gross Zibert mirror construction for Calabio varieties. And then the main point of the talk will be if I apply this gross Zibert construction to this particular non-compact Calabio varieties coming from cluster varieties, do I get something related to this combinatorial duality between A and X cluster varieties? And maybe I should have pointed out the construction I've given explicitly just before. I phrased it to produce X, but there is some kind of dual construction producing A still as a blob of, of toric varieties. Okay, so now I'm kind of uh, forgetting about cluster varieties, or no, I will come back to it at the end of the talk. Or no, I want to talk about 
uh, mirror symmetry. And uh, so I don't want to say anything about mirror symmetry in general. For the point of view of this talk, I want to think about mirror uh, symmetry as some kind of recipe given a variety or to produce a new variety. And the recipe I will present, I will take as input to lock Halabio pair XD. So it could be of the type I've just described, but it could be modular. So X could be any smooth productive variety over complex numbers. And D is any anti canonical normal crossing divisor. And I assume it's maximal, like, so it's assuming that this divisor contains a zero dimensional stratum. So in general, this normal crossing divisor, it has some components. And intersecting the components, I get a stratification of the normal crossing divisor. And I want this divisor to have a zero dimensional stratum. So for example, if you take a toric variety, it will always be the case. Like if I look at the example of P2, there will always be a corner of this triangle, which is a zero dimensional stratum of the divisor. So in particular, I want this divisor to be non-empty and I want it to be singular. I, I, okay. And so this thing would be the setup in which I will describe things. And maybe if you care about things like compact calabio, which is maybe the thing that people in mirror symmetry originally cared about. So I will not talk, talk, not talk about that today because I want to talk about cluster varieties, which are like on the non-compact side of the story. But actually what I will talk about is kind of relevant also to the compact situation because in mirror symmetry for compact calabios, what we really consider is not one calabio, but the degenerating families of calabios, which degenerate to some kind of normal crossing special fiber. And then if you want to deal with compact Calabio, you should do the same thing as what I will talk about now, but now you should apply this construction to the total space of this degeneration. And the normal crossing divisor should be the special fiber. Okay, so if you care about compact Calabio, what I will talk about is also relevant in growth and zibet construction apply for compact Calabio. But for now, I will focus on this kind of non-compact or log pair situation X and D. And given such a log Calabio pair, what a mirror symmetry is supposed to produce as an output is some mirror X check. And this mirror will really be a mirror family, it should really be a family of varieties. And maybe in general, it would be on some kind of formal family. And maybe in nice cases, this formal family would be some honest algebraic family over some base. And so what is a CSS base? Here yeah, I denote formal spectrum of C double bracket any of X. So I'm looking to N E of X, which is essentially the monoid of curve classes, of effective curve classes uh, in X. And so I have C bracket N E of X, which is a corresponding uh, monoid ring. And, uh, and I take the formal completion of that with respect to the natural maximal ideal obtained by the, uh, so this monoid, the only inversible element is zero. So I take the complement completion with respect to the maximal ideal, which is everything minus zero. And I get some kind of formal uh, formal thing for which I can take the formal spectrum. Okay, so if this, uh, you know, if this cone of effective curve is just n to the power something, then this thing would just be in some affine space and this thing would just be the formal completion of zero inside this affine space. Okay, so this thing, or more concretely, the base of the family, what are functions on this base? They are like monomials of the form t to the power beta, where beta are curve classes uh, on x. Again, okay, so why do we want the mirror family to be a family over this base? It's because a mirror symmetry, is, whatever it is, it's supposed to exchange a symplectic or Keller geometry of x with the complex geometry of the mirror. And so on the mirror side, I really expect to have a family of complex varieties. And the base of this family should be related to the kind of symplectic or Keller parameter of the mirror. And you should think of this uh, base here as being related to curve classes, as being some algebra geometric version of the Keller, of algebra geometric version of Keller parameters uh, for X. So, so it is why some of these bases uh, is somehow is the expected one. Okay, so given X and D, we want to cook up a mirror family over this space. And what then, what Gross and Zibert propose is a recipe to do that. And the recipe involves enumerative geometry 
of the starting log allele pair x t, and it will involve the geometry of rational curves inside x and t. And actually, the enumerative geometry of a particular kind of rational curves, the thing I will call A1 curves, which are rational curves in X meeting D in a single point. Okay, so it's a very special kind of rational curve. I look to rational curve in X. I might divide the normal crossing divisor D, and I want this rational curve to intersect this divisor in a single point. So possibly with multiplicity, with some non trivial tangency, but in a single like set theoretic. A point. So for example, here's some picture. If I have P2 and if I blow up one point on the boundary, I get an exceptional divisor E. So the, the exceptional curve itself is an example of a one curve because uh, it is a curve in the blob and it is meeting the divide, uh, boundary D, which is this triangle in a single point. But there are also such a uh, rational curve, for example, on this picture in blue, I have drawn the strict transform of a curve in P2 passing through the point I blow up at the opposite corner of the triangle. The strict transform of this line is this blue thing, which is again a, a one curve. It's again meeting the triangle in a single point, yeah, a corner of the triangle. So you can check that actually in a toric variety, there is no A1 curve. For example, in P2, you cannot have a curve meeting a single side of the triangle because if I have a degree D curve, it has to meet every every line in D points. So in the toric variety, there is no such a curve. But after you do this blob, you will obtain a lot of such a curves. And some other point is that some mirror symmetry for toric variety or like for tori is something very simple. And the mirror symmetry for general uh, log labio pair is roughly like what happens in the toric situation, but corrected by the existence of these curves. And say corrected by counts of appropriate counts of such a curves. Okay, so maybe I will act. Okay, so so these counts of curves, you can use them to define some kind of combinatorial object called a wall structure or a scattering diagram, which will live on the tropicalization of the log Halabia pair. And so what do I mean by tropicalization? Yeah, I simply mean essentially the dual intersection complex of the pair, meaning that for uh, uh, for example, so for, for every zero dimensional stratum in my in the stratification defined by the norm by the divisor D, I will consider some n dimensional standard code. So R greater or equal to zero to the power N. And then I will glue these cones together according to the intersection patterns of the strata uh, in the device. Okay, so if I, if I have a stratum of co-dimension R, I'm attaching to it a standard R-dimensional cone, like an you know, R-dimensional vector space. And then I'm gluing all these cones together according to the intersection pattern of the divisors. And so what I get is some kind of abstract cone complex, some abstract gluing of cones. So if you do that starting with a toric variety, you will, you will produce a cone complex, which is naturally, uh, which can, you can naturally identify with a fan of the toric variety. And in the toric situation, the fan naturally live in a given vector space. So all the cones, when you glue them together, you see thing as a natural structure of vector space. Whereas here it will not be the case. It will you cannot canonically identify this uh, union of cones inside a fixed vector space. It's just some abstract uh, set of cones. But still, locally it looks like uh, uh, something living in a in a vector space. And uh, and essentially, so on these on these kind of combinatorial gadgets, this kind of union of n-dimensional cones, uh, you can uh, uh, draw some co-dimension one loci, which will be decorated by power series, which will be essentially generating uh, generating functions, generating series, and counting counts of these kind of curves, counts of these kind of A1 curves. So I don't want actually to spend too much time to go, in, to go into the 
uh, details of that. So, so here on this example here, I, see, uh, I start with P2, I, have, I do one blob, I get this triangle for the divisor. So the tropicalization will still be the union of three coins, maybe still look like the fan of P2 somehow. And in this picture, I'm drawing some number of rays. I'm drawing this blue things. And these rays, the way I draw them is related to the existence of these A1 curves in this geometry. And then there will be some algorithm that I will not go into, which given such picture, given the some enumerative information of counts of all of these A1 curves, there is some recipe to write down some algebra, actually an algebra over these rings C double bracket N E of X. And I will not go into the definition, but it's some kind of recipe to uh, cook up an algebra. And actually this algebra in this uh, construction come with a kind of canonical basis. Maybe the so only- that, Yes, uh, sure. without, without going into, uh, so I, I definitely am not gonna ask you to say the rest of yes. but what goes into the rest of me, you're saying not, now not just torque things or torque like things, you now have added these red triangles. And what matters is the, or these red, these, the information of these blowups uh, that, that are now in the diagram. And you're saying now you have, and it doesn't really matter how big you draw the triangle since it's sort of just the, their symbol, their symbolic or how you draw, where the curves are. Is that right? And then there's a rule for you draw these curves and loops and they join in various ways and come in in different angles, I guess. And- uh, Yes, yes, yes. And, 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 and then you sum over them all with certain, contribution based on how they're going in and then you use this recipe for the out that's how so now the, this is algebra that also works with the red now the out the, the recipe involves the red triangles in some in this yeah way. yeah that's right yes yes okay. yeah so maybe the only comment i will make is like why the output is not an algebra versus base c bracket any of x is because if i have a, a one curve i would somehow weight it with its homology class with its curve class so everything everything is made of power series in uh, like variable t to the beta, where beta is a curve classes, because I'm looking to generating series of such curves. And so the output of the construction will naturally involve these power series in curve classes, which is why the thing will naturally be some kind of formal family over these base involving curve classes. So somehow the fact that you produce something of the correct base is kind of built in into the construction. And so to make that a precise, there is a lot of work to do. And the precise numbers which are involved in these constructions are example of something called punctured log chromophotor invariance, which is something which I've been recently developed by Abramovich, Chen, Gross, and Zilbert. So just uh, maybe just a comment. So usual chromophotor invariance are counting curves in some algebraic varieties. And log gramophyte invariants are counting curves in the algebraic variety with some normal crossing divisors. And you want to impose uh, how your curves interact with the normal crossing divisors. And, um, and the punctured aspect of the story is some kind of further refinement where you want to allow uh, intersection numbers between your curves and your normal crossing divisor to be not uh, positive integers, but possibly negative integers, which naively does not really sound, seems to make sense in algebraic geometry. It sounds like if I have a curve intersecting a divisor, I want the intersection to be positive. But the point is that if you want the intersection to be negative, it's actually possible if your curve uh, lies entirely inside the divisor. And so uh, definitely if you, if you have a curve, which is entirely inside the divisor, the intersection number of the curve with the divisor can be negative, certainly it can be. And so the point of this kind of logarithmic uh, technology is to somehow on your curve, you still want a mark point and you want to think about this mark point as being the contact point with the divisor, even if the curve is entirely inside the boundary where now it seems that all the points are contact points, you still want to have a specific point on it where somehow where the contact really happens. And, and so there is some kind of uh, big machinery which uh, allows you to do that. So, so at the end of the day, there is some kind of variant of usual Gromov-Witten theory, which allows you to make sense of this number. 
and it is its numbers that you use uh, in the construction. Okay, so this thing is a kind of very uh, general construction which take as input some uh, log labial pair, and which take as input some enumerative geometry. This kind of uh, slightly complicated version of chromorph with invariance. And the first thing uh, I want to mention to go towards coming back to the world of cluster varieties is that uh, when my log labial pair XD is obtained by starting with a toric variety, and if I blow up some hypersurfaces inside the boundaries, the claim will be that uh, in this case, all these uh, complicated enumerative information actually you can recover it in some kind of algorithmic way, starting from the combinatoric, which define your trig variety and the blobs that you are doing. So in some ways, it's kind of, so in general, you need to solve this enumerative geometry problem. And if you have a general variety, you don't really know how to do that, they're just numbers. And, but the point will be that for varieties coming from blob of toric varieties, you can, in some sense, solve this enumerative geometry problem in some kind of explicit algorithmic way. And this thing is some uh, result of uh, Argus and Gross. And I will only praise it in a quite of unprecise way, as I just said, that somehow that this enumerative information, you can reconstruct it in an entirely uh, uh, algorithmic way. And I will not go into it, except that what you need to do is essentially you try to, so essentially you have a, some kind of a combinatorial data, some kind of co uh, collection of codimension one loci in some space. And these codimension one loci are decorated by a generating series. And to each of these generating series, you can view it in a kind of geometric way as defining an element in some kind of Lie algebra of vector fields on tori. And so you can look to the kind of corresponding formal automorphism. And then you can try to play a game given such collection of uh, automorphisms. You can ask the following game if you draw uh, some kind of loop in your space. And if each time you intersect one of these codimension one loci, you take this automorphism. Then you can take the composition of all of these automorphism. And you say that your full collection of data is consistent if for every loop, this collection of automorphism is an identity. And the claim will be that if you know part of the data of, and it will not be consistent, the kind of, there will be some purely algebraic statements that there will be a unique algebraic way to complete it in a consistent way. And what you will need to be able to do that, we'll essentially need to compute commutators in these groups or in these algebra. So more, if when you go around, if your product of automorphism is not the identity, whatever it is, you will correct your data to try to make it uh, the identity. And because everything is made of power series, you do that somehow order by order in the power series. And at every order you ask, is this structure consistent or not? You correct it to make it consistent at the next order and then you iterate the process. So this is some kind of big algorithmic uh, machinery. And the theorem of Argus and Gross is that some of these uh, algorithmic machinery somehow in some sense solves the enumerative problem of enumerating these A1 curves for log halabial pairs coming from blobs of toric varieties. So, 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 so this suggests that like, when I hear this and you're building the coefficients inductively, algorithmically from smaller and smaller beta, it feels like the way you do this is you're trying to figure out something with a certain beta and get the answer in terms of smaller beta. So there's some trick, some WDVB type, you know, you know some sort of trick where uh, that turns it into smaller, uh, uh, that is that, can it be restated in this way or is it just- Yeah, so maybe, yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's not really WDV, maybe it's more like a degeneration type argument. Yes, that's right. yeah. That somehow uh, you have your thing is obtained from toric thing by doing some blobs. And some other thing you certainly know, like the kind of initial data, some of just the exceptional curves or like the curve inside the exceptional divisors. 
definitely these things are part of the A1 curves. And the claim will be that all the other ones are somehow built from these ones in some ways. And, uh, and you can somehow kind of understand that if you do some kind of degeneration, if you pu push the locus where you do this blob, and infinity, you do some kind of degeneration to the normal cone, you can break this geometry into some kind of toric piece and some kind of non-toric pieces, but that you kind of understand. And uh, actually, this kind of algorithm, you can interpret it as some kind of tropical picture, actually. How do you build your general curve in terms of simple data? And in this generation, you reduce to some kind of toric situation. And you can really do some kind of tropical geometry for this toric variety. And so tropically, you will have some kind of graphs, some kind of trees. And uh, the claim will be that you know something about like the like the unbounded edges of your trees, and you want to reconstruct the full trees. And uh, actually, these trees are some kind of the kind of graphical counterpart of these uh, algorithm, step by step algorithm. So, really, the kind of geometric arguments going up is this kind of degeneration. You go from this kind of non toric situation, which kind of degenerate to a kind of more toric like situation. And it's kind of more toric like situation, the kind of what happens is kind of a uh, um, can capture tropicality, roughly. Okay. So now I'm arriving to what is so the re end, which is actually the content of, of our paper and which will be able us to make contact with cluster varieties. It's a general a property of these mirror families. So by construction, if you have a club lock club your pair. You run this machine, you produce this family over this base, formal spectrum of C double bracket any of X. But uh, the claim is that for the varieties obtained by blow up of uh, toric varieties, actually, we don't, we will claim that this family extends over a base which is bigger than the naive one. And, uh, and this thing would be important to make contact with the duality of cluster varieties. And uh, so, so, so it's not just formal. You're going to build an actual plan. So, so, so it will it will not be as strong as saying that uh, I can go from formal to not formal. It will be it will be not formal in a specific direction. It will remain formal in some direction, but it will be non formal in one specific direction. Okay. So, what are these two directions? So, I was saying I obtain as blow up of toric variety. So, if I just look to the group of curve classes in X. I have, I have naturally curved classes which are pulled back from the toric variety X like sigma. And then I have this EI, which has the P1 fibers of the exceptional devices. Okay, I'm blowing up collimation two loci. So my exceptional divisor are P1 bundle of eight. So I have P1 fibers, which are like new curve classes, EI, which has, and, uh, and and so on the block, my new group of curve classes are like the one coming from the target variety plus is EI. And I want to consider these uh, monoid Q, which are made of uh, classes of the following form. They are like effective toric classes minus sum of I, A, I, E, I. So minus non-negative multiple of the E, I. So roughly, I want to look at curve which have non-negative intersection with the exceptional devices. Okay, so uh, this thing is like one set of classes Q, and on the other end, I have the set of like effective curve classes in X. So I pretty think are two different things in the set inside the group of all possible curve classes. I have the effective classes and E of X, which in general is complicated to describe. And I also have this Q, which are classes of this particular form. And essentially, the claim will be that we'll only care about curve classes which are in the intersection of these two things. So curve classes which are both effective and inside Q. And if I want to phrase it in a kind of more geometric way, I can think in a dual way. I can look to spec C bracket NEX. And if I just pretend that these monoids are finitely generated like toric, this thing would just be an affine toric variety. And spec C Q will be another affine toric variety. 
and I can glue them uh, together along the natural uh, common intersection. So I will obtain the following picture. So now it's a, it's some torus variety obtained by gluing two affine patches. So I have like two torus fixed points, which are like the two corners in this picture. And if I look to one near one corner, I have just a spec any of x. And so my original mirror family a priori is defined in the uh, formal neighborhood of this point. So what I did not hear in black dot around this point. But now I have glued to that another thing, this spec C bracket Q, which somehow uh, produced me this bigger, bigger base picture. And if you think about what are we doing geometrically, so we have this particular curve classes T to the EI, EI, so you have this particular coordinate T to the EI on the base here. And this point is defined by uh, setting T to the EI equal to zero. And we extended this base by allowing T to the EI to become infinity. So more at this other point, you have T to the minus EI equal infinity. So here in blue on this picture, you have some kind of P1 where we have kind of homogeneous coordinate T to the EI and T to the minus EI. And the main uh, theorem of our paper joint with Argus will be that uh, our mirror family, which at the beginning live in this dotted disk around this point, actually extend to this dotted red region. So it kind of becomes non-formal in this blue direction. So actually it extends all the way in the blue direction and in this red direction in a non-formal way. And it still remains formal in the transverse directions to it. Okay, so it is uh, uh, the statement. And, uh, and there is some kind of mirror symmetry explanation for that. So, so, and actually in this picture, so actually this picture on this red line on the left, you can show that you recover the mirror of the toric variety X sigma. So the more in this picture, you start with our like mirror of our non-toric thing, and we do some kind of analytic continuation. We kind of extend the family. And if you go on the other side, and if you specialize, we get the mirror of the purely toric thing. So you get some kind of deformation from the mirror of the non-toric thing to the mirror of the toric thing. And this thing is kind of expected from general mirror symmetry because X is a blow up of the toric thing. So you have this kind of birational transformation. And since birational transformation, okay, in, algebra, in algebraic geometry, some kind of discontinuous operation, we do a blow up. But in a kind of symplectic or Keller point of view, some kind of continuous operation where the volume of the exceptional divisor, you can decrease in continuously going to zero. So it's like moving continuously in the kind of symplectic or Keller parameter. And so on the mirror side, it should be corresponding to a continuous deformation in the complex parameter space. And it is what sees uh, what we have here. Okay, so concretely what uh, this thing is saying is that in the uh, constructions, uh, when in our enumerative problem, the only curve classes which really produce something interesting are classes of a particular form. They are not random effective curve classes, but they are uh, curve classes of a particular form. And some of the proof of that relies on these uh, previous theorems, this kind of algorithmic description of, uh, of the problem. We rely on that to prove uh, this theorem. And so finally, in two minutes, I can explain the connection with cluster varieties. So now I look to cluster varieties. So as I introduced at the beginning, these cluster varieties are their compactification. They are kind of special case of these varieties obtained by blowing up toric varieties along thing as a boundary. So for example, I can start with the X cluster variety and I can run this gross Zibet mirror construction and get the mirror family, this formal mirror family. And the question is, how do I compare it with the foreground chart of dual A cluster variety? And so there is some kind of easy case is that if this variety is affine, then Kiel and U using some non-Archimedean point of view on this mirror symmetry construction proves that in this case, actually the formal, this thing is a nice case where the formal family really extends all the way to a nice algebraic family. And in particular, you can take the fiber over one in the big torus in the kind of base of this kind of obvious algebraic family. And the easy 
thing to state is that you recover the A cluster variety as a fiber of a one in this kind of fully extended non-formal algebraic family. So in this picture, the claim is that if the thing is uh, affine, the thing extends all the way everywhere, and you can just look to a fiber of a point in the middle of this picture, like a, like where my, I don't know if you see my mouse in the very middle, you can just put one inside the torus here. And the claim is that the A cluster variety is sitting here. So the thing answer the question, what is the relation between this mirror family and the A cluster variety? If you can extend it all the way around, you just look to the point in the middle and you recover the A cluster variety. But what we wanted to answer was, okay, if the thing is not affine, then the mirror family is really formal. It does not extend all the way down. So what can we say? And what we can say is that we cannot make contact with the A cluster variety, but we can make contact with these kind of degenerated version of the A cluster variety I introduced at the beginning, which was used by Grossa, Kinke, and Konsevich. And the answer is, is this picture here. So on this picture, I claim that my extended mirror family extends all the way inside this dotted red region. And then I can restrict to this green thing. So what is this green thing? I can, so there is this red thing is like where the purely toric thing is living. And it's actually spec C bracket. So it's something made of curve classes coming from the toric variety. And I can look to one inside this torus. So it's like setting to zero all curve classes coming from toric varieties, but not the others. And so it's restricting to this green slice here. Which, so, which is still formal in the, this kind of green transverse direction is still formal. And the main theorem is that if you do that, you recover this kind of degenerate version of the A cluster variety. Here's the moral of the story is that if you want to start with the X cluster variety, and if you want to run mirror symmetry and find something related to A, in general, you need to do something non trivial You need to know that your mirror family, which a priori is defined on this black dotted region, actually extend to a bigger region. And then once you know that, you can specialize to this green slice. And it's only after that, that on this green slice, you can get something which is naturally related to the A cluster, right? And sorry for being a little bit over time. I will stop there. Thank you very much.